and we're here with Logan Mullen. Logan, what is up? Oh, not a whole lot. How about you? I'm doing great. People probably who watch on YouTube are like, wow, Evan, you're you're dressing nice today. This is that is nice. Different. That, that struck me too. It's yeah. I mean, it's like, whoa, it stuns you in your tracks a little bit. I got the button down going. The reason is I uh, am doing a on-camera project for the NCAA with college hockey. I'm not going to say what it is because people will see it, but I just got done filming uh, some stuff for it. So you guys will enjoy it. It's Olympics related. So I think you guys will really like it. Um, not exactly NHL players in the Olympics, but uh, I think it'll still be a really good Olympics this year uh, with the guys they got, even though it won't Stephen be no Camper. Brad Marsh. Yeah, they got Stephen Camper. And I think and I Aaron Ness. Aaron Ness. Is David Warsofsky on that roster too? Uh, he was on the short list. I forget if he made the actual one, but the, the David Warsofsky mm-hmm. was on like the, the initial one. Yeah, David Warsofsky, Evan Marinovsky. It's, it's the same yeah. thing. How old is um, David Warsofsky now? You could tell oh, me no. he's like 37 and I'd probably believe you, but I'd be willing to bet he's only like 29 or 30 or something like that. I was going to say, I feel like he's been around a while. He is 31. David Warsofsky's yeah. 31. So that's like I, where I might guess where he would be. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, uh, you've it's been a little while since you've been on. Um, it has. You took... You took some time off at the end of December, which was smart. I did. advantage of that, which was a good idea. Only um, missed one Bruins game because of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, you <laughs> missed the Islanders one, I would assume, right? It was the Buffalo one on the way on New Year's Day. Yeah, I think I took like 10 days off between Christmas and New Year's and literally only missed one Bruins game. <laughs> Do you do anything fun? You you know, no, you I did travel the world? nothing. <laughs> I don't blame you. Like, I think people, I think uh, doing absolutely nothing is underrated in, yeah. in, in taking breaks and stuff. Like that is like the best, you know, you just don't do anything. I've had to alter my relationship with that because I used to be very bad about it. And now I have zero remorse about doing it. <laughs> I don't blame you. See, I'm 22. So I have a tough time, like not doing anything. And then when I don't do anything, I'm like, wow, this is actually like, kind of fun. You know, yeah. not too bad. Um, anyways, Bruins right now rolling. Last time you were on, this was not the case. Now it is much the case. Eight yep. of nine, they have uh, won. They've gotten eight and a half out of the last nine potential points, uh, or ten possible points, I believe. Um, no, eight and a half out of nine, because they went to overtime. No, no, they didn't. Yeah, the Wait, only I, game they wrong. haven't won was the Minnesota one. Minnesota. Someone replied. Damn it. I, this is why I can't go off when people reply to my tweets. So I, I tweeted that the Bruins had won eight of nine during the Patriots game because, as everybody yeah. knows, when the Patriots are losing and you cover another team you that plays the same time. You, you connect kinda, it, right. You, you got to pump it up a bit. And uh, I, someone replied, well, eight and a half out of possible nine points. And I was like, oh, yeah, overtime against Minnesota. But no, they didn't. They, they just lost that game. Yeah, that was regular. Um, I got to stop listening to people. But – uh, they look – this team looks good. And for the first – you know, they're getting statement wins, right? You get that Nashville game, especially on Saturday, which was hard-hitting, bruising. When was the last time we saw the Bruins win one of those bruising games? I feel like it's been a while. Yeah, it has been a long time. I, I'm The closest thing I can think of was that early March game in 2020 before the shutdown against the Lightning. But they lost that one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you might have to go back to like the. Uh, I remember it was the 2019 Cup final against Toronto. I, it might have been Game Two, where the Bruins already were getting criticized for not being tough enough. Tough enough, and from the drop of the puck to start the game, it was just a complete gong show, like running guys and whatnot. It was like nothing I had seen before from a a Bruce Cassidy led Bruins team. But it, it is not something that happens commonly. Yeah, and I think again, getting a win like that because I remember that game two one because they had lost game one. I believe it was like four to one. They got out yeah. tough. It was just the whole thing was terrible. But you look at this team, and that you know, it, granted, one game doesn't mean everything, but you get that physicality. You get that you know the the, the way they won, right? You know, you got Erho back in nine and breaking the play up in overtime. Taylor Hall scores the winner. They're getting secondary scoring. Is this starting to become more than just like a hot streak and starting to become, hey, maybe this is the team they got? It's so tough to tell because I feel like the Bruins usually are due for one of these heaters at least once a season. Um, And 
I don't think we'll know how good of a run this actually was until we're in like March and we have a better sense of who the Bruins actually are because th- th- this might just be a you caught lightning in a bottle for a couple of weeks and then you know they end up being a 500 team enough to get in the playoffs but nothing special or it could be you know this was the jolt that they needed to actually show what they were capable of being I mean I think the simplest way to put it is this is what the Bruins envisioned when they built this roster, right? Like the Eric Holla being good. I I mean, they've been without no sec for some of it, but these pieces around the margins that they added that were supposed to add, you know, a little bit of scoring or at least open things up for other players. And then you also have younger guys pushing the more established veteran ones. I think, you know, it's sort of a confluence of things that point to the fact that this is probably what the Bruins maybe not, you know, 900 winning percentage, but they, <laughs> this is what they thought they were capable of being. We have to see how long the consistency lasts because historically this season it has not been there. But I think that, you know, there's you can't just take points in eight out of nine games and not be feeling good about yourself. Like bad teams and below average teams just don't do that. They don't. And I also think it goes back to one move and it was made, I believe, right before the Buffalo game coming out of that COVID pause. And it was switching up the top six, which is something that a lot of people have been saying for quite a while was like, just move Pasternak down, move Smith up and let, and and, I mean, granted they moved Hala in for Charlie Coyle, but that's kind of been what's driven this. Like the first lines produced the way it kind of has always produced Pasternak scoring a bunch of goals the chemistry's kind of coming together with him and Taylor Hall. The top six has been working. I feel like that's another that's one of the huge parts that people forget. That was the whole that came right out of the the COVID pause uh, yeah. that they that they made that move. And I think that move has really uh, not been the main thing, but I think it's been one of the main things that has gotten them to this point. That's why I think that this might be more than a trend and actually might be what this team is because they made that that switch. Yeah, well, it opened a lot of things up, right? Like, all of a sudden, once you figure out a way to get that top six working, you know, the the third line looks a little bit better. And part of that is the emergence of Oscar Steen. But the fourth line, all of a sudden, you know, I'm I'm going through the numbers today. They've got, after waving Carson Kuhlman, they have 14 forwards, basically. And if you have everyone healthy, assuming your third line is like DeBrusque and Coyle and Steen, and then no second Lazar locks for the fourth line. You've basically got Felino, Bleed, and Frederick fighting for one spot. And I mean, imagine Nick Felino even two years ago suggesting that he'd be a, either a fourth liner or a healthy scratch guy. Now they'll probably end up putting him back on the third line, but it's just allowed their depth to sort of shine because you and I, I think the last time I was on here, we talked about this. The biggest problem for the Bruins was that they had guys playing above where they probably should play. Like they were never getting soft matchups except for the first line more often than not. And now finally you're starting to look at and say, all right, well, Eric Holla can hang around on the second line. And then you get to put Charlie Coyle on the third line where he's a far more impactful player. Um, You know, Jake DeBrusque for that matter. Oscar Steen, you know, maybe one day he's a top six player. You need more offense out of him. But, you know, he's playing in a role that's very comfortable and, you know, well-suited for him. So I think, you know, the top six thing obviously is a big part of it. But the subplot and all of that is it just opened up a litany of opportunities. And you hit on this one. And I think, again, when DeBrusque gets traded, I feel like Felino, unless they trade DeBrusque for another forward, Felino would be the guy to go in on that third line. Right. I think the fourth line is becoming set. I know you mentioned Frederick. I think Frederick is the odd man out here. Anton Bleed is great. Anton Bleed has been terrific um, in every aspect. He's putting up points, which I think is kind of a trend. Uh, but he's, you know, he forechecks hard. He fits well alongside Lazar and Nosek. He's a menace. I mean, that dude is like a pest. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, like he's been around. I, I said this to Connor on Poke the Bear. He's been around for a while. He's been around since. 20, was it 13? Was he draft? Was that yeah. when they got him? Oh, I, I was just going off of when he had played his first game, which was 2016-17. Yeah. Um, but he 2013 was when he got drafted? I believe so, yeah. It, and I, I've felt the same way about Bleed. I historically have not been 
you know, a, a you know, grand marshal of the Anton bleed parade. A bleeder, but, a bleeder. <laughs> yeah, a bleeder, if you will. But, you know, that was a guy that probably could have tested the water somewhere else. You know, he's signed a few of those small contracts that's basically kept him in the organization. And, you know, there have been a few times where he'd probably be well within his rights to be like, just cut me loose and let me see if I can find somewhere else. Um, but, you know, he's stuck around and good for him. He's found a way to carve out a role. And I, I agree with you. He, in my eyes, he should be above Frederick on the, the forward depth chart. And what it comes down to is, are they going to do that, right? When Frederick comes back, are they going to do that with a first round pick? You know, are they going to say, oh, we're going to have this journeyman kind of player slot over a first round pick? I don't know. And they and they should like bleed is the guy. I think that yeah. fourth line, that fourth line grouping they have now, like you can match that up with other teams, top lines. You can do things with a good uh, fourth line. As Cassidy's shown that when you have a good fourth line kind of makes everything roll. Yeah. Um, but you look at, so you look past uh, just the scoring, right? They're getting these statement wins. You know, you go to Tampa, you get the win there. Washington, you get that crazy overwhelming win. Yep. Uh, Nashville, even Nashville's like low key, or at least going into that game was the top uh, point getter in the West, which yep. like blew my mind uh, when I figured that one out. Uh, but they're they're getting these big wins, and one of the things that's so funny, you look at the contrast between the 2021 Bruins and the 2022. And the 2021 Bruins did not win those games. Like those would have been losses. Yeah. Um, is there anything else aside from the offense, you know, aside from the line changes that have made this work? I mean, I feel like back in nine might be in there for the, the, the short term. Yeah. Well, he's definitely in there in that, you know, the Bruins could have been in quite a pinch when they started losing guys to injuries and COVID. So, you know, if you find yourself, you're the Bruins and, Tyler Lewington is a perfectly fine player for who he is. He shouldn't have been playing any higher than the third pairing, but you, know, you, <laughs> Tyler you, Lewington. But you can do <laughs> that with Vakanine, right? Like they've tried Vakanine and out with McAvoy. Like he, the fact that he's been a good enough stopgap is enough to say that, like, okay, well, the defense has certainly been a part of it because structurally and from a pure numbers standpoint, like the Bruins have been a pretty good defensive team this year and it seemed like they kind of had things figured out and you know grizzly going into COVID protocol impacted things of oral getting hurt you know a month and a half ago at this point it didn't help but like you know by pretty much any metric the Bruins actually have been a pretty good defensive team this season even though their goaltending's been middle of the pack so you know I, I think that's gotten lost especially in the chatter that you know they need to add another defenseman which you never can have too many, but yeah, I mean, it definitely goes beyond the forward thing. I think we've just gotten used to the defense being largely good um, that we've sort of glossed over that. Mike Riley being better has definitely helped too. Like that, that was the thing. Riley and Carlo weren't good at the start of the year individually or as a pair. And the fact that they got back on track, the two of them has been very important. Yeah, and again, it's not—it's not even just Mike Riley's offense because he's—you know—obviously that goal against Nashville was pretty, right. and I mean that's crazy patience out of a defenseman. I feel like if that was me, I feel like I just—you know—as a defenseman up there, I would have just like shot it immediately, right? Like never yeah. would have uh, held on to it that long. But it's also his transition game, right? He's—he's he's moving the puck better. He's breaking the yeah. puck out a little bit better out of his own end um, and through the neutral zone. So I think those are helpful things as well. One thing with that and um, that I, I kind of want to stir the pot a bit, kind of like you with that Belichick column yesterday. Yeah. Uh, stir, got to stir the pot a little bit. You don't want that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I do. That's not for me. Um, but the back and Einan thing is interesting because one of the two common threads this year uh, is two left shot defensemen who m most perceived to be busts and still might be for where they were drafted. Earl Vakanine and Jakob Zaborl fit in this year, right? Jakob Zaborl, before his yeah. torn ACL, was a top, uh, was a was a mainstay, right? On the third pairing, could could move up in the lineup, looked terrific, looked the best he's ever been here, um, and looked to be, you know, when everybody got healthy, to be a guy who'd be fighting for lineup spots. And now Vakanine is looking like that. And as Bruce yeah. Cassidy said, you know, it's an every night league. This is not something you can come up for five games and look tremendous and then slack off. You got to be good all the time. But for well, Vakanine has been up here. He has been good. Yep. And is it a case of obviously, you know, some guys take longer to develop than others. And this would be a case of taking a long time to develop uh, or especially long time. 
But is there any case that these guys could kind of pan out, that they're just slow growers and that maybe now is when they're panning out a little bit? Yeah. Oh, I think that's definitely a possibility. And the thing I always go back to is like, if you ask any AHL coach, they will tell you the toughest position to develop its defense. And further to that, when Zaboral and Vakaninen are both European players. Now Zaboral played juniors over in North America. So he had a little bit more time to get acclimated to the rank size, but like defense is a hard enough position to develop professionally. No less when you go from the bigger rank in Europe to the smaller one, like Vakaninen had to do. And some of those guys that are really pure skaters and whatnot, like they all of a sudden have to start making plays in tight way more against guys who are very skilled and I don't think that that can really be overstated how impactful that can be sometimes. And I think it's easy to point to like Moritz Sider or uh, Miro Heiskinen and say, well, those guys didn't, you know, Cyrus playing in Germany and whatever. But, you know, for one, Vakaninen went pro at what, 19, 20 years old. Uh, he's mm-hmm. only 23. This is around the same time as Zaboro was 23 when he started to pan out. I think sometimes it just takes a while. Now, that can speak to a philosophical thing of, well, do you want to be the team that has to take its time developing someone like this? Or do you want someone who might be a little bit more, you know, NHL ready or elite at the AHL level type of player? that's up for debate, but I don't think it's far-fetched at all to say Vakaninen could still work out. I think that is entirely plausible. Um, and it just, it never made sense to write him off too early. And I think now you're kind of starting to see uh, what they could have there. Yeah. Cause again, they don't have that. And I don't, I don't know if Vakaninen could be that top pairing left shot defenseman. He's holding in there well now. Um, right. I don't know if he's that answer long term. I don't know if you can uh, get to the second round of the playoffs or the uh, or the conference final or even the cup with him as your top pairing defenseman. Um, but I think you at least have someone in there that can go into the lineup. Like I think that's the important thing and can also like slot up there, which is also yeah. pretty good. So well, th- that's what Forbert is, right? And, yes. and like he, he, it's different for him because he's shut down and Vakanainen still a little bit more of like two-way does a lot of things well but not great but like those guys exist and if you're playing with charlie mcavoy then like you're allowed to be just good at a lot of different things instead of really great at one yeah and i but the so the 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 contrarian point to that would be you have a lot of those guys grizzlick forbert uh bakaninen zaboral even you have a lot of guys who could go up on that uh, top pairing and are good at it but are are not great you know can you can you do the good not great thing to get to the cup. I don't know. At some point you do have to draft and develop or get somehow a legit top pairing left shot defenseman. I don't think that's going to come at this deadline because I think the price for Chitrin is super high, but that's something that we'll discuss at a later time. Cause that's a hot button topic. Um, but one difference into 2022 Tuka Rask is back. Tuka is back. And uh, I will say one of the funniest parts of being in the building for his return on um, last Thursday There's... was that uh, every time he touched the puck, every time the puck came near him, the two thing started, which is great, right? Like that's, that's, that's what you want. But like there was a puck that I forget who shot it went off the post and everyone was chant like was doing the two. And I was like, well, come on guys. Did you know that like hit the post? Um, but don't let that take away from the fact that he looked terrific. Uh, he, to me at least, I grant I'm not a goaltending expert. I was a pretty good goalie in mini hockey, but that doesn't really translate to regular hockey. Um, I, I, he looked great. Like he looked like regular Rask. I would not think that he was someone who just came off of an eight month layoff. Would you agree with how Rask looked? I would. The number one thing I was looking for was puck tracking, which he seemed to be fine with. Like he had been cleared for game action for, I think just about a week if not longer by the time he played so like the health that he was always supposed to come out on the other side of it just fine and so I think the the big thing was like mechanics and puck tracking and like I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm an NHL goaltending expert but 
know, nothing seemed off. Like there were times where you'd watch him last season and, and it's easier to see now in hindsight. Right. But it just something didn't seem right. And he was still making saves, but there are the occasional ones where it's like, ah, he usually gets to that. And he, he didn't. And so it, I thought he looked fine. I, you know, you have to consider who they were playing. Like they were playing a truly dreadful team Thursday. Um, <laughs> but, <true. laughs> the, you know, I, I don't know. I, I thought he was fine, but you have to see it be a little bit more sustained, I guess. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I think you'll see that tonight when they play uh, Carolina. But I also think, you know, he had those two breakaway saves, which were, which were good, right? Cam Atkinson, yep. Joel Therapy, those were legit. Yeah, you know, the Joel Farabee is a very nice player. Yeah. Yes. Um, you have the wraparound by Cam Atkinson at the end of the game. Uh, you know, again, and Rask mentioned that after the game where it was like, that's a play I might not have been able to do last year with uh, before the hip surgery. So yeah. there are little things like that. And, and you mentioned the puck tracking. This is kind of the same thing, obviously. Positioning, right? Just being yeah. square to the shooter uh, was terrific. And I think it's funny. You see the difference between Rask and Olmark the next night. And I think people are going to start to see it even though, you know, Omar got it done against Nashville, there were a lot of, you know, I think two of the three goals were pretty soft, if I remember right. So, like, you're going to start to see that. I think Bruins fans are going to start to pick up on, like, oh, that was a pretty soft goal let in by Omar. And it's like, yeah, that's what happens when you don't have two grass in the net. Like, right. people are going to start to see, like, you know, it's always funny to me, and I always bring this up, it's it's tough that Tim Thomas was the goalie before Rask yeah. because Thomas was always out of position, but he never quit on a puck, right? He always had to dive across the crease and – do like, you know, acrobatics in the net to try to keep the puck out. Whereas Rask doesn't do that because Rask is simply in position for like 99.9% of shots. But to the average fan and to the, to the eye test, it's like, wow, Rask just doesn't work as hard. He doesn't care as much. And I think you're going to start to see now where Omar cares, obviously, but he's, you know, he can be out of position sometimes and some, you know, softies get let through and you'll start to see it with Rask where it's like, oh, those don't, you know, those don't go in on Rask all the time. So maybe people will see it. Maybe, maybe they won't. Um, I am interested, though, to see Rask long term, right? Like, I am interested to see his next, like, four or five starts. Mm -hmm. I think he'll be fine. But I think, you know, we, as you said, we can't get all, like, yeah. all bent out of shape about I, I, one game. I try not to be a victim of the moment. And, like, it's hard sometimes because the equally, like, if he was awful against Philly, then I probably – would have just said like, well, you know, what did you expect? Like to me, anything other than bad was probably good. Um, but you only, you know, in, in being good in that Philly game, like he kind of shortened his leash a little bit because you've already seen what he's capable of doing. It's like, okay, he's starting to, you know, look like he knocked some rust off. He looked like there might not have been that much rust. And now it's like, okay, well, if he goes out against Carolina, a markedly better team than the Flyers, and looks like a puddle, then that could be a problem. Uh, and again, I think we're still weeks away from knowing how good he actually is and what his form actually is. But I will take Tuesday's game against Carolina far more seriously than I took uh, Thursday's against the Flyers. Yes. Oh, for sure. Carolina obviously is a million times better. I completely agree with you um, on that. In other Bruins news, uh, Carson Kuhlman has been waived. We expected that to happen, um, you know, and we also expected a team to probably pick him up. And it was Seattle who picked him. Um, not a surprise, as I said. Like he's a guy who, you know, through the years here, earned you know got lineup chances. Defensively, I think you tweeted this. Defensively was good. Offensively, just never really like great shot, but never really like did anything in the offensive yeah. zone. Not a lot of points. Um, good for a fresh start. That's a guy who like Zach Senishin's like, damn, how can I do this? Uh, I'm still <laughs> Jake Debrusk is too. I'm sure. <laughs> can I just get waved? Yeah. Um, do you think Coleman will ever pan out? Like, do you think he'll become like a? Yeah, I, good I think he's an NHL player. Um, yeah, you know it. What didn't help his case is and. and you know, Bruce Cassie, I think, has kind of winked at this before that, like, we were talking about Trent Frederick earlier. If you're a first round pick, you're going to get way more latitude than somebody who is undrafted, like Kuhlman was. And so when you look at the fact that the Bruins have all of these guys that basically project as bottom six players, like 
Trent Frederick. I mean, you know, Steen, they didn't invest quite as much in, but you know, he's, he's a little younger, uh, has some more offensive upside. Like, I think that what happened with Kulma is he just kind of got lost in the shuffle and he wasn't good enough to sort of overcome that. And I think if you put him on the right team, you know, he'll probably be a middle six guy for Seattle. If I had to guess, uh, he's going to get a lot more ice time. He'll hopefully have more of a chance to shoot because when he shoots, it's very good. Uh, he had a very underrated shot, but basically he just got, moved around a lot and it ultimately was to his expense or at his expense because you think about how early on in his career he was looked at as the second line right winger right like that it was him or David Backus that entire playoff run and then he came back the next season and they didn't get a right winger for Krejci and DeBrusque and so who started that season uh the 2019-21 the second line right wing it was Kuhlman and he was playing above where he probably should have been playing um but it'll be his defense that keeps him in the NHL. He is a great skater. You can't teach that kind of speed. And, you know, I, I think in the right opportunity, he will probably get a chance to prove that he belongs. I can see him having a decent career as one of those, and probably a journeyman, like probably a guy that gets one, two year deals to play fourth line slash 13th forward uh, roles around the NHL. But, I think he is most certainly an NHL player. Yeah, I think he'll slot in on like Seattle's third line. I think that's a great spot for him. And I wish him the best. I hope he gets all the ice time he never got here. Like, I think, again, I think we sometimes overlook the fact that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, our jobs, right? If if you're looking to get, you know, a good job and they have you covering something that you don't want to cover or you're, you know, they have you doing all these different things, it can be it can be tough, right? It's the same with any job. Uh, whereas with him, they had him on the second line. They put him on the fourth. You know, he'd get, and then he wasn't, you know, they obviously wasn't on the power play or super big on special teams. So when he had a special teams heavy game, he'd get lost in the shuffle there. So yeah. just never, this was never in the cards for him here. Uh, but again, happy to see him go out to sea, as he would say, you know, S E A. Got to end on a high note here. Um, but yes, Coleman, I, I do think, um, I am, a, you're right. The, the journeyman thing, I think, is correct, where it's like, you know, he, you know, two year deal here to your deal there yeah kind of just always bolsters a team up so we'll see with him it's yeah i'm trying to think of a appropriate equivalent i mean there are probably a billion of them um but i, I you know joakim nordstrom right like yeah that's chicago your to carolina uh, and then up to boston then calgary like those guys exist you need those guys um so I, that's what i kind of see for him I was thinking like a Chris Kelly, but he was uh, he was here longer. He was here too long. Daniel Paye, maybe. I don't know. If yeah, that, that could Sean Borden to a degree. I mean, not similar players, obviously, but um, you know, Sean Thornton played for a few teams. So I mean, they're, they're, those guys. And not to say this is kind of dismissive, but like they grow on trees in a way, right? Like those guys always exist. There are plenty of them without NHL contracts right now, um, but. You know, part Lindholm is probably a good example of the type of guy where Lindholm wasn't in the NHL for long, but you need those guys that can plug in and play at any given moment. And if you need them to play for a longer stretch of games and they play a longer stretch of games, you just need them one game stopgap. Then you need that. Greg McKegg. Greg McKegg. Greg McKegg. Example. Great example. I think Coleman might be a little better. I think Coleman will be more of like a third liner, but yeah, we'll see. We'll That's see. It's probably a ceiling at this point. Yeah, that's that's what I would say. Unless he just pops off, I guarantee you he scores in like his first game for the Kraken, and we'll, yeah. we'll see it on Twitter. And it's, it's like how like, Donato oh. scored in his first game with the Wild after the Coil trade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, or like Danton Hyde is just going off this year yeah. um, down in Pittsburgh. But they still bungled any, that one. But yeah, that's a whole nother. That's a whole episode. Um, gotta love Nick Ritchie being put on waivers too up in Toronto. Yeah. That was uh, that's fun. Um, so much for him being the future up there. Anyways. Anyways, uh, Logan, what can the people look forward to uh, with you over at Nesson? Oh, just the Nesson Bruins podcast every Tuesday usually is when it comes out. Um, and then, you know, rumor season is a big time for Nesson.com. So, uh, you know, we have, I would like to think, a pretty robust selection of Bruins coverage on the day-to-day. And then also some of those more macro, micro type of stories, you know, a little bit of both. So, yeah. Nesson.com slash Bruins. 
It's like a buffet. Pick what you want. Yeah, Anyways, exactly. a little bit of everything. Logan, a little bit of everything. Logan, thank you so much for coming on. For CLNS Media, I'm Evan Marinovsky. You Bruins Beat listeners, have a great rest of your week. Thank <laughs> you.